Um, welcome wherever you are. I want to get right into it today. I'm going to read a passage of scripture. And then as I said, we're, we're kind of entering into, it's not just really a, a series, but I just feel God continuing to impress this on my spirit, that it would really be a season where in an elevated way, not that we haven't, but in a marked way, we would pray for the sick. After all, Jesus said, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. And so I want to spend just a few minutes today preaching faith into your spirit, and then we're going to leave some margin for God to do what he does best, which is miracles. And we've already prayed for the sick today, people getting touched by God. All right, Isaiah 53, uh, verses 4 and 5, often referred to as the pro prophetic salvation passage. Isaiah 53, verse 4, it'll be on the screen as well. The, the prophet says, surely he, Jesus, took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. I want to preach for just a few moments today from the subject, willing and able. Willing and able. Um, I'm praying and I've been praying for you, that it actually becomes easy for you to believe God for healing. Whether that's in your physical body with sickness, pain, disease, or your mind, your emotions, your heart, uh, maybe there's demonic oppression or even possession, Jesus is your healer. If there's cancer, Jesus is your healer. If there's trauma that you can't seem to get through, Jesus is your healer. If there's arthritis or high blood pressure or pain, Jesus is your healer. And it's important that we understand Jesus is not just a healer, but Jesus is your healer. Your healer. Because that's the problem I would guess, um, and I would suggest for just about everybody in the room, I, I would believe that most of us, if not all of us, are here today because we, we would probably say, oh, I know Jesus could heal. But how many know that there's sometimes a great gap between Jesus could and Jesus would? Somehow in the church at large, and, and I'm, not, I'm not talking about the cost church because I, I know you all are faith people. But in the church at large, uh, people have sort of intellectualized the power right out of the gospels until all we're left with is debate of scripture and and, and theological frameworks that mostly do away with miracles. And somehow often, very often, people that actually just go for what Jesus said to go for, go for healing, go for power, go for miracles, it's kind of like, well, I don't know about them. I don't know about all those crazy, you know, let's call them charismatics or let's call them Pentecostals. And I don't know about all that. And, and, and somehow... We've often listened to theologians that have no experience with God's power, but only a misguided education that makes no room for God's power. And they say stuff like, well, God just doesn't do that anymore. But I'll tell you what, when life goes down uh, and you get in trouble or you're sick or you're suffering or you're in pain, I don't know about you, but I am not looking for a dried up theologian with a degree. Come on, I'm gonna go find me a church mama and knows how to lay hands on me and pray in tongues until I get delivered. I grew up with some of those church mamas and they prayed me right into my pulpit. If you want to know how charismatic church I am, I, I went to a church all my life called Shiloh Miracle Center. But here's what I'm saying. We got to get back to keeping it simple. We, we need sound, simple, solid, biblical theology about what God can do. We've gotten so good at programs, and we've gotten so professional in our preaching, and, and we're, we're so pro with it. It's kind of like, Holy Spirit, like, we, we like you, we love you, but we, we just don't really, today, we just don't really need your power. Here's what A.W. Tozer said. I've got this on the screen for you to look at as well. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. I say we get back cause church to 95% of what we do is Holy Spirit power. 
So if you want to know what the Cause Church is all about and somehow you missed the giant sign on the wall as you came in, our vision, we are a people of God's presence. And when you get in God's presence, you encounter God's power and you're set free and you're healed and you're made new and you're restored and there's a difference and something real takes place. And around here, we're unsatisfied with remembering the revivals of the past. I say, come on, we go to God until we get a revival of the present. If we're going to believe God for healing, here's what's very necessary for all of us to do personally. We've got to know that it's God's will to heal. And I know that there are questions, and I'm not ignorant of that. And what about what happened to aunt Susie and they had great faith and what about them and and I get it I, I lost both my parents at way too early of an age but here's what we can't do we can't allow the questions and allow what we don't know to overshadow what we do know Jesus is a healer so I want to show you just quickly now that and I'm going to make a bold statement but it's a biblical statement I want to show you that just as much as it's God's will to save you from your sin, it's God's will to heal you from your sickness. Here's a Bible phrase, healing, spirit, soul, and body, healing is part of the package of the atoning work of Christ. It's part of the atonement. That's chapter 53 of Isaiah. It's, it encapsula encapsulates the atonement, salvation from our sin, healing from every sickness, pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, by his wounds, we are healed. You might say, well, okay, don't get carried away, preacher. That's your interpretation. If you don't like my interpretation of Isaiah 53, how about the evangelist Matthew's interpretation of Isaiah 53? Matthew chapter 8, 16 and 17. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to Jesus. He drove out the spirits with a word and healed all. Everybody say all. all. He healed all the sick. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our affirmities and bore our diseases. All throughout scripture, wherever God would declare the truth about the coming Messiah, salvation from sin and healing from sickness were never separated. That's something that religious people came along and did much later. But, but from the Bible, we don't have this or that. We always have both in terms of biblically. Even the Greek, all throughout the New Testament, uh, that's, that's translated as save, to be saved, salvation, it comes from the Greek sozo. It's, it's there over a hundred times, and it means to save, to deliver, to make whole, and to heal. It's almost interchangeable. That's why it doesn't say who the sun sets free is kind of free. It doesn't say who the sun sets free is sort of free. But come on, Bible people, who the sun sets free is free indeed. The, the Greek there brings out this tone of text that would, would say something like this. Who Jesus sets free is really, really, really free. They're absolutely, they're really free. Jesus died on the cross so you could experience sozo. Saved, healed, delivered, so your kids could experience sozo. Jesus didn't die so you could be some of the way free, but so that you could be all the way free. And when we get free, it brings glory to God. And when we get free, it always brings in a harvest of souls. And people, you need to get free. The Bible tells us that as children of God, we've received an inheritance in Christ. An inheritance. You could kind of look at it like this. Imagine you had like a rich uncle that passed away and you know the lawyer calls you in and says well in your uncle's last will and testament come on we have an old testament and a new testament in your uncle's will and testament well I've got some good news we've got good news as well we've got gospel good news I've got good news your, your uncle decided to leave you 10 million dollars you look back at the attorney and you're like wow that is good news but you know what I'll just take a hundred I'll leave the rest sitting there. Here's what I'm trying to preach. There's so much more available through our inheritance. 
It belongs to you because Jesus paid for it and gives it to you and Jesus wants you not to have some of it but to have all of it. And sometimes unbelief will have us leaving our spiritual inheritance sitting in heaven's bank. So, so I say we get unsatisfied with leaving, with, excuse me, living in a percentage of what Jesus paid for. You, you gotta get something in your spirit where you get, you get unsatisfied. Where, where you don't just glaze over the great precious promises of God and say, well, that's kind of nice, but you say, I want that for me. God, it brings you glory and it's for my good. I'm unsatisfied. I want all of what you paid for. God says, I want you to have it. All the prophets, they would, they would prophesy of the coming Messiah and they would say, not only will he save you, he's going to help you and he's going to heal you. When John the Baptist was in prison, about to get killed, John was like, I better make sure that I am clear that this is actually the Christ. If I'm gonna die, I wanna know this is the Messiah. So the disciples of John go to Jesus. They say, tell us the truth. Are you really who you say you are? Here's what Jesus says in response, Matthew 11 and verse four. Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. So Jesus said, if, if you're asking for my messianic credentials, here's your clarity. People are getting healed. Healed from all kinds of sickness, healed from pain, healed from demonic oppression. The poor are being, people are being healed. So, so here's what I wanna do. I wanna just quickly, because as I said, we're gonna leave some space and I'm traditionally not good at leaving any space, so I'm gonna do my best with the help of the Holy Spirit. I wanna quickly address three common objections to believing God for healing. I'm gonna give you some Bible, is that all right? Here's an objection. People might say, well, sometimes sickness and disease, uh, God uses to discipline. That's just simply unscriptural. It's not the heart of our God. Look, if, if we infected our kids with, with some kind of disease because they didn't clean their room. We'd be seen as horrible parents. We would be, come on, we'd be sent to prison. They'd be making Netflix specials about you. <laughs> now, I'm not trying to say for a moment that God can't turn it around and use it for good. That's just how good our God is. God can take horrible ingredients, put them in the oven, and still cook up something good for those that are called according to his purpose. But let's be clear, sickness, disease, pain, trauma, turmoil, that's from the enemy and was meant for evil. So if we're gonna trust Christ, we have to be clear. Where'd sickness come from? This is gonna help your faith, Acts 10, 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. It's a trick of the enemy to get you thinking, well, this might be God. I, it could, it, maybe it's God. Maybe I needed to, I'm, I'm being matured through this, this. Because after all, how can we believe God if we're blaming God? It's the devil. We gotta, we gotta get clear. This is what F.F. F. Bosworth, great revivalist, healing evangelist said. I have this on the screen as well. If the modern theology of those who teach that God wants some of his worshipers to remain sick for his glory is true, then Jesus, during his earthly ministry, never hesitated to rob the Father of all the glory he could by healing all who came to him. The Holy Spirit likewise robbed him of all the glory he could by healing all the sick in the streets of Jerusalem. And Paul too robbed God of all the glory he could by healing all the sick on the island of Melita. If sickness is God's will for your life, then every time you take an Advil, you are in sin. Every time you go to the doctor, you are in, when you put on your readers to get in the Bible, you are in sin. Come on, I'm thankful God can use doctors. And I went to the optometrist the other day and she was like, you're getting, you might have to get some, some readers. I was like, get behind me, Satan. I said, I'm 41, not 51. I started trying really hard to see. 
Ain't nothing wrong with some Advil because because we're just we're just partnering with what God wants for with God's will. I'm gonna pop some Advil before I golf tomorrow, and I'm gonna golf for the glory of God. It's called Old Man Candy. Where where does sickness show up? Sometimes it's the result of living in a broken, corrupted, sinful world. Sometimes people are born with sickness. Sometimes we make bad choices. We smoke for 30 years. We eat Twinkies. Sometimes it's an attack of the enemy. But here's what we can't do. We can't blame God and believe God. Well, now hold on a minute, preacher. What about Paul's thorn in the flesh? I'm so glad you asked. You know, I think what sometimes happens is that instead of reading the Bible, we let other people do it for us and tell us what they read and it messes us up. I'm sorry. Check this out though. This is what it actually says. We don't have to wonder what was the thorn in the flesh. By the way, that term is used in many other places throughout scripture. And it always represents enemies, and specifically, it represents people. Uh, Like in Numbers 33, God says to Moses, If you will not drive out the inhabitants of the land before you, then it shall come to pass that those which you let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and will vex you in the land wherein you dwell. In Paul's case, here's what it says, 2 Corinthians 12. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. And we've wondered, well, what's a thorn in the flesh? Next part of the same sentence. I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Did you catch that? It was a person used by Satan to cause problems. A thorn in the flesh is the Bible way of saying someone was sent by Satan to oppose me, to contradict me, to come against me. Anytime you go after promises, the enemy is going to stir up problems and the enemy will often send opposing people. So then how does God mature us, correct us, discipline us? God doesn't send a cold. God doesn't send cancer. God doesn't make us sick. God mostly corrects us through the scripture. God God will correct us through the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And and sure, if if we purposely take ourselves out from the covering of God through disobedience, Yeah, we can end up in some disaster, but even then, our God is the God that says, I will chase you down. I will seek after you. My love for you is an all-consuming fire, and I'll bring you out of your mess and into a great miracle. That's the compassion of Jesus. Okay, here's another objection. Is this all right? Well, sometimes it's God's will to heal, but not always. Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4. When Jesus came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So this leper understood, God, I know you're able, but the question was not, are you able? The question was, are you willing? I know you've healed other people, but are you willing to heal me? I know you can heal, but are you willing to heal me? And here's what verse three says. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing. Be clean. Immediately he was cleansed of his leprosy. See, I, think, I, don't think we get, I don't think we get tripped up on, is God able? I think, we get, I think we get into trouble with, is God willing? Jesus said, I'm willing, be cleansed. And instead of avoiding the leper touching him, which would have been the Jewish way, Jesus reaches out and touches the leper and says, I am willing. Is it always God's will to heal? You know, we just, we just went over this, that it's in the atonement. It's part of the atonement. When somebody comes to God seeking salvation, we would never say, well, come to the altar and pray like this. Oh God, if it be thy will, would you save me today? We don't pray like that. We, we, we know it's God's will to save. Then why do we lay hands on people that are sick and say, oh God, if it be thy will, save them, heal them from their sickness. We don't have to wonder if it's God's will to heal from sickness any more than we have to wonder, is it God's will to save? It's the atonement. Jesus says, I'm willing. And it echoes down through the ages of the church. We act like getting saved is so easy. Well, just raise your hand and pray the prayer and you know, grab that book and be saved. But which actually is really more difficult? 
to be saved from our sin or to be healed of a simple outward sickness. That's so simple that sometimes even doctors, even us humans can help people with that. But God, the God who can save us in our spirit, which is so much more powerful and deeper and spiritual, would say, if I can heal you in your spirit, surely you can trust me to do something as simple as heal you of your sickness. Is it always God's will to heal? Look at, look at a few verses with me. I want to bring these up on the screen. I've got, I just picked out, I just picked out these three. There's so many others. And every time I hit the word all, let's, let's say it together. Luke 440, at sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Matthew 815, a large crowd followed him and he healed all who were ill. Matthew 14, 35, 36, people brought all their sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. Everyone was always included. I've looked through the scripture. In fact, I've spent years and even decades looking through the scripture and there's not a single case where somebody came to Jesus wanting to be healed who wasn't. It's inclusive. Those are just a few. One time the disciples, they couldn't get this kid healed. This kid was an epileptic and was, was possessed by a demon and the disciples couldn't get the kid healed because we don't always get it exactly right. Not everybody that I pray for is healed. Some are, but not everybody. But we don't get weird about it. We don't blame ourselves. We certainly don't blame the people that we're praying for. So we stretch our faith. We enlarge our spirit we we know what it is to trust God but whatever we do we understand this that any lack is always on our side of the equation even when the disciples couldn't do it though Jesus steps in and Jesus gets the kid delivered there's always a way one last common objection is that all right give you one more and then we'll have the band up and we're going to pray we're going to believe God um here's something that sometimes people say they say well that's something that God used to do, but not anymore. It's what God used to do. Uh, is it all right if I shoot straight? This is an extra biblical doctrine invented by people who wanted to let their experience shape their theology instead of letting their theology then shape their experience. They're called cessationists. Overall, as a theological camp, cessationism, it goes something like this. People decide Jesus doesn't really heal anymore. That happened, and they come up with kind of phrases that, that sound very intelligent. They, they say stuff like, well, that happened during the apostolic age. That happened during the writing of the canon of Scripture, but God doesn't really do that anymore. And, and in fact, I'm so convinced that God doesn't heal anymore that I'm going to hide out in my basement, and I'm going to have a YouTube channel. I'm going to preach to as many people as possible that Jesus doesn't really do that anymore, and Jesus doesn't heal. And everybody else that's saying otherwise, they're in heresy. To be a, a cessationist, you have to ignore a whole lot of Scripture. Uh, I appreciate that one clap. Last... <laughs> Last year, our son Jude was in class, goes to you know, a Christian school, and uh, was in class. They were doing some kind of Bible lesson, and the teacher, who apparently was in fact a cessationist, was saying something along the lines of, well, you know, God used to heal people you know, during the writing of the Gospels and, and during this time of the New Testament church, the writing of Acts, but God doesn't do that anymore. Jude was like, Uh, it just happened to be that the previous Sunday, somebody was healed in one of our services while everybody else watched. And Jude was like, uh, teacher, you're wrong. You need to come to the cause church. People get healed all the time. You can't convince me that God doesn't heal anymore because not only is it saturated across the pages of scripture, I am the Lord that heals you, not I was the Lord that heals you, but you can't convince me because I've put my hands on people that had cancer and they no longer have cancer. I've seen Jesus do it. I've seen God do it. 
And maybe you're like, well, I don't know, like I haven't seen anybody healed. Then hang around this church for a while. You're about to. You're about to. It's, it's kind of funny because we, we have like these, these lists of the gifts of the church. Like 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, and God has placed in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, miracles, gifts of healing, helping, guidance, different kinds of tongues. And, and a cessationist has no problem with teachers, with guidance, with helpers, gifts of healing. No way. But it's on the same list. So we can't pick from the list that which we are able to accomplish in our own strength. We've got to get back to being the simple church that relies on the Holy Spirit and power. It's there and it's for all of us. Why have we ever tried to do the ministry of Jesus without the power of Jesus? If you, if you tried to take the supernatural out of this book, out of the Bible, you'd have about one third left. I don't know, preacher, some of this stuff is just weird. You realize that Christianity is weird. <laughs> to, to confess Christianity, and come on band, to confess Christianity is to believe that the son of the eternal God was sent to earth to bear the penalty of our sin, was crucified and then rose from the dead to guarantee our eternal justification, you realize that what we believe is kind of weird. Well, I just don't know. I just, I want to fit in and I want to be like culturally correct and I want everybody to like me. Then don't be a Christian. We believe in the soon returning Messiah. We believe in miracles. We believe that God used a donkey to talk. We believe in praying in tongues. We believe that there's a God that hears us when we pray. And I know it's weird, but it's not supposed to be the same as everything else. It's supposed to be like nothing else. So around here, we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. We believe that God is still doing something today. We believe that the sick can be healed. We believe the blind can see. We believe that those lame can get up and walk. Look, I don't think we can ever touch a generation by being cool enough, by having a big enough LED wall. Bring it on, I love it. But we're not gonna, we're not gonna see a city turned upside down. We're not gonna reach a generation by being relevant. We need power that's real, power that affects a life, power that breaks off the curse of darkness, power that sets people free from demons. People need the freedom that Jesus purchased. The ministry of Jesus didn't get canceled. It continues. I'm thankful that God didn't say, I was Jehovah Rapha the God that heals you? But that he says, I am Jehovah Rapha. I am. Not I was, but I am. Not, not you know, I know I said that I am the Lord and I do not change. And, and I know in that other place, I said there is no shadow of turning with me. And I know in that other place, I said I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. But with healing, I am going to change. Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals you. Jesus was a healer, Jesus is a healer, and he will forever be a healer. And I say we stir up our faith and we get back to believing our Bible. You know, the, the end of the day, I'm giving you all the theology and the doctrine, but at the end of the day, it's to know the character of Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus had compassion and healed them. That's really all you need to grab hold of. Jesus has compassion. Jesus understands and Jesus gets it and Jesus has compassion. He loves you. He wants you free. Jesus didn't just heal sick people to prove he was the Messiah. That was part of it. But other times Jesus was like, hey, I'm going to heal you, but don't tell anybody because it's not my time to go to the cross yet. So I'm gonna do this one in secret. Why? Because Jesus has compassion and heals you.